We just heard Tom Dressing talking about the ventricular tachycardia. And when you see it, you've got to tell your patient that you're going to, this is a bad prognosis. We're going to talk about something with better prognosis, which is supraventricular tachycardia. So what is supraventricular tachycardia? Supraventricular, so what's above the ventricle? It's the AV node and it's the atrium. A tachycardia is a heart rate above 100 beats per minute. So anytime you have some kind of fast heart rate originating from above the ventricle with a heart rate above 100 beats per minute, it is supraventricular tachycardia. Because the signal is actually originating above the AV node or inside the AV node, the ventricle will be stimulated or activated or excited through the Hesperkinji system. And thus, you're going to have a narrow complex tachycardia. However, sometimes in patients who have sick Hesperkinji disease or sick Hesperkinji system, what you end up getting a tachycardia with a little bit wide QRS, and that's due to a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block or, uh, or, uh, or IVCD. So what kind of tachycardias do we have that could be originating from above the ventricle? We have three kinds. We have, it could originate from the atrium, or it could originate in the AV node, or it could originate from um, an accessory pathway. And the accessory pathway would, we call it accessory pathway mediated tachycardia. And the reason we still call it supraventricular tachycardia is because the AV node and the atrium is still part of the circuit and is still part of the tachycardia. So let's study each one of these at a time. So what is HL tachycardia? HL tachycardia is any fast heart rate that originates in the atrium. So we could have multiple kinds of HL tachycardia. We could have what we call focal or ectopic HL tachycardia. What we mean by ectopic or a focal HL tachycardia is a fast heart rate that originates from one certain area inside the heart. So instead of you have a patient having the, the sinus node being the pacemaker of the heart, there's another competing pacemaker someplace in the heart that's beating a little bit faster or could be beating a lot faster than the sinus node and taking over the activation of the heart. That's what we call ectopic atrial tachycardia. Sometimes we see what we call re-entrant atrial tachycardia, and this is what we call atrial flutter. So there's no one area inside the heart that's actually acting as a pacemaker. What's going on is that there's an electrical circuit inside the heart that keeps running and running and running and never leaves, electricity will never leave the heart. And this could be running around a scar or a dead tissue. It could be running around a tricuspid valve. It could be running around a mitral valve. It could be running around one of the veins inside the heart. And every time it runs, it sends a signal down to the ventricle. It could conduct or it may not conduct. And then we have the different kind of what's called atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation is simply a combination of these two things. You have a lot of focal atrial tachycardias and you have a lot of micro reentrant atrial tachycardias causing this atrial fibrillation. Okay, so let's take each one at a time. So atrial tachycardia, focal atrial tachycardia, we all agreed that it's gonna come from a certain predefined, specified area inside the heart. What we sometimes use, we use the EKG to direct us where's that atrial tachycardia is coming from. Um, you know, we, we all know the axis, the one, two, three, four. If you have an atrial tachycardia coming from the, from the top part of the heart, you're going to expect that lead two and three to be positive if you look at the P wave because the activation of the atrium is going to be from top to bottom, something similar to the sinus node. If you have an atrial tachycardia coming from the left side of the heart, so it's going to be negative in lead one. If you have an atrial tachycardia coming from the bottom part of the heart, you're going to have, you look at the EKG, and you're going to have an actual um, a negative in the inferior leads. So sometimes EKG do help us with atrial tachycardia. So let's take some questions here and see if we can answer these questions right. You're consulted to see a lady with a rupture who had a ruptured appendix status post surgery, post up day two due, and the reason for the consultation is because the patient is tachycardic. She's, she's running 110 beats or 130 beats per minute. She's awake but in a lot of pain. And you've seen this telemetry strip. And then the surgeon asks you, and you said, okay, let me get an EKG. You got an EKG, something similar to this, 150 beats per minute. And then the surgeon told you, what are we going to do now? So what are you going to do? 
Are you going to start metoprolol, 25 milligram twice a day? Are you going to, have a, going to give her IV metoprolol? Are you going to start DEJ? Or are you going to pick Cardizam or none of the above? So let's go ahead and... Okay, excellent. It's none of the above. If you look clearly at the EKG, this is a sinus tachycardia. The patient is in a lot of pain. She's had surgery. This is sinus tachycardia. When we look at the EKG, it's positive in lead two. This means it's top, it, and lead three, it's from top to bottom. And it's positive in lead one. This tells us that it is coming from the right side. The treatment of sinus tachycardia is never get better blocker calcium channel blocker. Treat what's going on. If the patient is in pain, give them pain medicine. If the patient has urinary incontinence, put a Foley catheter. If the patient is not breathing well, give them a little bit of oxygen. One of the only few times where we actually treat sinus tachycardia if actually the patient has some active cardiovascular disease, something, for example, a very stiff heart, a really hot, uh, a coronary artery disease causing angina or something like that. Otherwise, please treat the cause. So sinus tachycardia, it's a regular rhythm. It's above 100 beats per minute. It's a normal P wave axis, meaning it's positive in lead one, two, and three. And the treatment for that is not beta blocker, is try to treat the cause, whether it's anemia or something else. Then we're going to take another case, a 73-year-old gentleman with long history of COPD being admitted to the hospital with COPD exacerbation. On admission, the heart rate is 110 beats per minute. You were asked to see him restarting Coumadin for atrial fibrillation. And the diagnosis and the plan, and this is the EKG. So let's look at this EKG for a couple seconds. So a patient comes in with a COPD exacerbation. And what we're going to do with this EKG, the diagnosis is in fact atrial fibrillation, and we are going to start Coumadin. This is atrial fibrillation. However, Coumadin is not needed at this time. Controlling COPD exacerbation will not likely correct this arrhythmias. Beta blocker is the treatment of choice of this arrhythmias. Or calcium channel blocker is the treatment of choice of this arrhythmias. We're just going to have, just a second, we're just going to have a look at this EKG one more time, and please answer. Okay, excellent. Most of us agreed that this is actually, calcium channel blocker is the treatment of choice for this arrhythmia. So what is this arrhythmia? If you look at this EKG, what you're seeing is that it's fast, it's a little bit irregular, but if you look at the P waves, and if you look at, for example, lead V1, you're going to see so many different kinds of P waves, okay? It's this P wave, there's this P wave, there's this P waves. This is what we call multifocal atrial tachycardia. And what's going on here is that the heart is, is so irritable that so many pacemaker sites inside the heart is being active. The treatment of choice for these usually occur with lung disease, and the treatment of choice is control the lung disease. Give them oxygen. We can, unfortunately, we can't give them beta blocker. We can sometimes, but beta blocker could make lung disease a little bit worse, especially if you have an acute COPD or asthma exacerbation. So the treatment of choice would be beta blockers. Um, another form of this atrial tachycardia is called, we call it wandering atrial pacemaker, and that's when the heart rate is less than 100 beats per minute. But the treatment for that is pretty much the same thing as atrial tachycardia. One thing that I want to tell you is that with atrial tachycardia, and I'm going to take you back all the way here, um, is that atrial tachycardia doesn't depend, the atrial rate could be different from the ventricular rate, okay? You could have a heart rate here going 200 beats per minute, but that signal may be filtered by the AV node, and the ventricular rate may be lower. However, with accessory pathway mediated tachycardia, every time this gets activated, this has to be activated. This activated, this has to be activated. Nodal tachycardia, the tachycardia is running here, it activates up and down. So the only tachycardia that could cause more A's than V's, so if you're looking at an EKG and you're seeing that actually, in fact, you have more atrial, more P waves than a QRS, then think about atrial tachycardia, okay? Um, so we're going to go to a different case right now. We have a 43-year-old lady that presents to the emergency department with interm intermittent rapid palpitations over the past five years. She developed sudden onset of rapid palpitation with chest tightness and neck pounding. 
Okay. Past medical history is asthma. She is on Adver. Blood pressure is 100 over 70. Heart rate is 160 to 180 beats per minute, sometimes 200 beats per minute. Skin is moist, lungs mild, expiratory wheezing, cardiovascular exam tachycardic, no murmurs, no gallops, luckily, with this heart rate. No JVDs, abdomen is soft, extremities, there's warm, and there's no edema. And this is the EKG that you're seeing. Okay, so we're gonna look at this EKG for a little bit. And then what are we gonna do to this lady? You're gonna give adenosine, you're gonna start low pressure IV and then get cardiac enzymes like what most ER do. Everybody has to get cardiac enzymes. Consult cardiology for emergency left heart cath. Amuderone, another favorite drug for the, our folks in the emergency department. Or is it none of the above? So this is the AKG, and this is what we're gonna do. Oh, we got that wrong. Okay, who answered E? See, look for these clues and the tracks. She's asthmatic and she's wheezing. Adenosine is not the right track. All of us got it right. All of us thought that this is supraventricular tachycardia. All of us believed that this is AV node reentrant tachycardia. The treatment of choice would be adenosine, but not if patient is actively asthmatic, okay? Treatment of choice for these chi patients is verapamil or vagal maneuvers. Actually, verapamil works as good, if not better, than adenosine, okay? Um, so, uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, it's a trick question, but you're gonna see some trick questions in the book. Good job for people who answered E. Um, Yep. So what, are, what, this example, what, what I showed you is an example of what we call AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or nodal tachycardia. So we covered HL tachycardias. This is AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And what's going on here is you have a reentrant circuit running around the AV node. The circle, there's an endless loop of electrical activity running around the AV node. And every time this circle runs, the atrium will be activated and the ventricle will be activated. So you have it, you have activation that starts in the middle, and then simultaneously the A and the V gets activated. So what's gonna happen, your P wave is gonna be at this, you're gonna have an atrium activated at the same time as the ventricle. So you're gonna have a P wave at the same time, you're gonna have a QRS. We have a bigger QRS compared to the P wave, so most likely we're not gonna see the P wave. So every time you see a tachycardia where you do not see a P wave, Think about AV nodal reentrant tachycardia or junctional tachycardia. Sometimes the P wave actually occurs at the end of the QRS, and you have to look at the EKG and look at the end of the QRS, and you'd see that there's here a little bit more negativity during tachycardia compared to sinus rhythm, or a little bit more positivity in V1 compared to sinus rhythm. It tells you that the P wave is hidden someplace at the end of the QRS. And at that, if you see such a thing, also think about junctional tachycardia or AV node reentrant tachycardia. Fortunately, we don't see a lot of junctional tachycardia in adults, so we don't have to worry about that. So the diagnosis is usually AV node reentrant tachycardia. So feel free to give adenosine or verapamil if you want to. Okay. The treatment, the treatment of nodal tachycardia is, again, adenosine, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or vagal maneuvers. Um, okay, let's take another question here. A 22-year-old college student present, admitted for a motor vehicle accident. She's in moderate pain. You were called to see her because of she's having palpitations. She did report multiple episodes of palpitations associated with lightheadedness lasting for one to two hours for the past five to six years. And you saw a tachycardia like this. And again, said, oh gee, you know what? This is a tachycardia. I see a P wave at the end of your QRS. It's a supraventricular tachycardia. I need to give adenosine. Why? Because adenosine will stop the AV node and we'll see if the tachycardia is gonna continue or not. If it continues, this means that it's, the AV node is being involved in the circle, a cycle. And then you decided to give the adenosine and the patient actually converted, converted to this kind of rhythm. Okay? And what are you gonna do next? 
the further for rift hard cut due to the presence of a right bundle branch block in a, a young individual? Are you going to ask for a cardiac MRI because of this uh, significant conduction delay? Are you going to ask her to see somebody like me with a catheter and an electrical generator? Excellent. <laughs> Good job. Trained you all. <laughs> no. This is actually a WPW, okay? Um, there's two school of thoughts. If somebody has supraventricular tachycardia, you gotta, you gotta take care of it, okay? Especially if it's a woman, especially if it's a woman. Because beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are not the safest medicines that we have in pregnancy. Beta blockers could cause a decreased birth weight and calcium channel blocker could cause vasodilatation and muscle relaxation in the placenta and the uterus and it could cause prolonged labor. And this SVT could get worse during pregnancy. And believe me, you don't want to be dealing with somebody who's pregnant and having an SVT and passing out. So um, best actually approach is to get rid of this WPW. WPWs are actually fairly common. There are one in a thousand in the population. There are more men than women. Too bad for us. They're the second most common cause of PSVT. The first common cause is AV node arrangement and tachycardia. So you have two kinds of accessory pathways. You have something called concealed and something called manifest. And it's just purely English. Manifest meaning you see it. Concealed, it's hidden. So why this accessory pathway could be hidden? It depends on the actually conduction characteristics of this accessory pathway. The conduction characteristic, if they only conduct anterograde, meaning from top to the bottom, from the atrium to the ventricle, then the sinus node, the signal is going to come down to the AV node and activate part of the ventricle. It's going to go down to the accessory pathway and activate part of the ventricle through the accessory pathway. So the resultant, the ventricle will be activated by both an, the sinus node, I'm sorry, the AV node and the accessory pathway. And that's why you end up with what we call a delta wave. And the delta represents the ventricular tissue myocardium that's being activated by the accessory pathway. If you have a concealed pathway, meaning an accessory pathway that doesn't conduct anterogradely, doesn't conduct from here down, it only conducts upward, from the ventricle upward, then the sinus node signal, when it comes down, it's not going to come down through the accessory pathway. It's only going to come down through the AV node. So what's going to happen? You're only going to see a ventricular activation that looks like as if you don't have an accessory pathway. But do these do those accessory pathway cause any problems? Yes, they do. Because what you could have, you could have, a, you could have a circus like this. And it could cause tachycardia. So both of these actually, both of these manifest and concealed accessory pathway could cause tachycardia. A concealed pathway meaning conducts retrograde. You could have a uh, the circuit running like this. And because the ventricle is activated through the AV node, the QRS is going to be narrow because your ventricle will be activated through the Hesperkinjus system. If you have an antidromic tachycardia, meaning running this way, meaning the ventricle is actually activated through accessory pathway, you're going to see a white complex tachycardia. And if you have two accessory pathways, you're going to see a really white QRS too, something that looks like a VT. Um, again, because the AV node is part of the circuit, then any of these agents that are, can block the conduction across the AV node could terminate these tachycardias, okay? Whether adenosine, beta blocker, verapamil, or vagal maneuvers could terminate these tachycardias. We have another 22-year-old college student with prior history of palpitations lasting up to a few hours. Few of these episodes in the past actually required adenosine. He presents with sudden onset of palpitation that started an hour after taking a high energy caffeine drink. And I didn't write this question after all this uh, energy drink stuff that we've been hearing on CNN. He believes that the episodes feels much different than the prior episode that he've, he've, ne uh, that he've had when he needed a little bit of adenosine. So it's like, okay, fine, let's get an EKG. So you got this kind of EKG. And and what are you going to do next? Give adenosine, the same stuff that worked before and everything went well? Are you going to give verapamil? Are you going to give procainamide? Are you going to give digoxin? 
or are you going to give verapamil or procainamide? So you have this kind of EKG. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, this is, most of us said procainamide. And why it's procainamide? The reason for that is that this gentleman has atrial fibrillation. And um, you look at this QRS, and actually it's a variable. And the degree of pre-excitation is actually, it differs between this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So if there's significant irregularity in the rhythm. This means that this patient is having atrial fibrillation. And there's significant irregularity in the, in the amount of pre-excitation. That's another, another reason why this patient have um, atrial fibrillation that's running down an accessory pathway. The problem with this patient is that his accessory pathway conducts really, really fast. Because if you look at the end of the slide here, you're going to see these two QRSs that are so close to each other. Something like, like 300 beats per minute. This tells you that the accessory pathway can conduct really, really fast. So any medicine that you could give this patient that may slow the conduction across the AV node may actually promote the conduction and the accessory pathway. So oh, let's look at the things that actually blocks conduction across the AV node. Adenosine does, verapamil does, procainamide maybe, digoxin yes. So all of these actually decrease conduction on the AV node. However, there's only one of them that decrease conduction in the accessory pathway, and that's procainamide. Okay. So if you're faced with such a situation, I would either use procainamide, you could use amiodarone if you want, but when you see this fast QRS, get that cardioversion machine and feel free to use it if you want to use it. <laughs> okay? But give them a little bit of sedation. But in the meantime, you could try a little bit of procainamide. Okay? You don't want to give anybody with atrial fibrillation with a rapidly conducting WPW anything that could slow the AV node. Because what's going to happen is that all the signals will preferentially go through the accessory pathway. And if they go through the accessory pathway, you have atrial fibrillation here, and you have an open highway that goes into the ventricle. So atrial fibrillation will be equal ventricular fibrillation. Okay? So if you want to use procainamide, fine, use procainamide, which is very good, but make sure that there's an EKG, there's a, there's a, a cardioversion machine around, around you. Okay. So we talked about that. So summary for the tachycardias that we've discussed so far, HL tachycardia, they usually don't terminate with vagal maneuver because they don't depend on the AV node. And you can have more A's than V's. AV and RT's, you, the P wave is hidden usually in the QRS, and you can terminate them with vagal maneuvers because they're dependent on the AV node. AVRT, meaning accessory pathway mediated tachycardia or atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardias, they terminate with, the, with vagal maneuver or adenosine because the, because the AV node is part of the circuit. Okay. Let's shift gears a little bit. We have um, Mr. Smith, who's a 45-year-old gentleman who comes to your clinic following a visit to the emergency department. He had, um, this time he came with his ED discharge papers with the diagnosis of atrial flutter. Last week, he experienced a sudden onset of fluttering sensation in the chest. He thought that his heart was going to jump out of his chest. He went to the local ED where he was told he has atrial flutter. The fluttering sensation was gone in four hours. Later, he was discharged and was asked to follow up with his family physician. Over the past few months, the, this gentleman did report occasional skipped heartbeats, but he never had any palpitations. No history of any cardiovascular or pulmonary disease. His review of system was benign except for irritable bowel syndrome, which I don't know what it is. He does not take any medications. His physical examination was normal, and his EKG done at your clinic showed normal sinus rhythm and normal EKG. So you check the papers that you got from the emergency department, and the CBC was normal, the basic panel was normal, the TSH was normal, cardiac enzymes, as usual, they were normal, and chest X-ray was normal. 
And he had this EKG labeled that this the gentleman have uh, uh, luckily ATL flutter, not something else, okay? So what's your diagnosis to this gentleman? Is it ATL flutter? Is it supraventricular tachycardia? Is it atrial fibrillation or is it sinus tachycardia? We'll try sim start simple and, okay? Okay, uh, it's a split between atrial fibrillation. No, it's not a split. There are more atrial fibrillation folks than atrial flutter, yes. <laughs> so let's look at this. So what's the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, especially if you only see in one rhythm strip? What fools most of us is something called coarse atrial fibrillation, okay? And what is, so what's coarse atrial fibrillation? You know, when we look at the rhythm strip, we want to see it, this fine fibrillatory wave, so to call it AFib. If we see anything that's coarse, up and down, up and down, we make the mistake and call it atrial flutter. Atrial flutter, as I told you, there's a predefined circuit inside the heart keeps running. So the heart is always running around that same circuit. So the heart will always be activated the same way. It's fast, but always being activated the same way. So flutter waves is when you see these flutter waves, they have to be exactly the same. Shape, amplitude, or duration, and duration. So when you look at these things, if you see that between this one and this one, between this one and this one, if they're exactly the same, same amplitude, same width, same shape, then it's flutter. Otherwise, it's coarse atrial fibrillation. And this gentleman, unfortunately, has coarse atrial fibrillation. We do see this in patients who have a healthy myocardium, healthy left atrium. It's a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So varying cycle length, varying amplitude, varying um, shape of the uh, flutter wave, of the F waves, we call it atrial fibrillation. So what are you gonna do to this gentleman? We made the correct diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. Are we gonna give our favorite drug, amiodarone, for a week and then discharge him on 200 milligram? Or is the other favorite drug, warfarin, and hook him with our warfarin clinic? Or are we gonna give him aspirin? Or are we gonna do 2D echocardiography and a halter monitor? Or are you gonna refer him to me for an atrial fibrillation ablation? What are we gonna do? Right, okay, good. So we're gonna, oh, excellent. Most of us believe that we should get a 2D echo and a halter monitor. Exactly right, because the reason for that is we wanna assess, is there anything wrong with this gentleman's heart? Okay, is there anything wrong with it? why this young gentleman have atrial fibrillation? And the assessment of the heart, whether this gentleman have structural heart disease, heart failure, valvular, valvular disease, mitral stenosis, could help us find a heart disease, but also could help us with our management on how we're gonna manage this patient with respect to, the, with respect to rate control and with respect to anticoagulation. Unfortunately here, I can't give him amiodarone because this is his first episode. I have no idea when he's gonna be in his next episode. It could be in 10 years. So I can't subject a gentleman to an, any kind of antiarrhythmic medication based on the first episodes of atrial fibrillation because I don't know when it's gonna happen again. I, can't, I don't know if I need to give him Coumadin or not because I don't have his risk profile for stroke, okay? So the best thing, same thing for aspirin, he might need coma, then he might need aspirin. But so the best thing is that we need to do an echo and a halter. And the halter monitor would give us an idea about if the patient is having what we call silent atrial fibrillation, is it very frequent? What's the heart rate during activity if he goes into atrial fibrillation? So you got the EKG. So the minimal workup that I would actually recommend for atrial fibrillation is get an EKG, get a metabolic abnormality, make sure it doesn't have kidney problems, liver problems. Uh, check an echo, check for LV function, and check for valvular abnormality. I do not recommend, or nobody would recommend a stress test unless the patient's having some symptoms. It tells you that I have chest pain with exercise or I have shortness of breath with exercise. Because uh, coronary artery disease does, I mean, rarely, rarely cause atrial uh, fibrillation because the atrium could actually get good blood just from the blood sitting in the left and right atrium. Uh, pulmonary, make sure that they don't have sleep apnea, bronchitis, asthma, 
uh, check for CMP and check for thyroid disease. Okay, so we get an echocardiogram. Luckily, the echo showed no structural heart disease one at all. You got a halter monitor, and luckily we were able to catch another episode of atrial fibrillation. And the heart rate ranged between 100, around average around 110 beats at rest. And when he was doing some stuff in the house, his heart rate was 155 beats per minute. He was symptomatic during this episode, and we got these heart rates. And now, what are we going to do? Are we going to go back to our favorite drug, amiodarone? Are we going to give him warfarin? Are you going to give him aspirin? Are you going to give him metoprolol? Or are you going to refer him to me for afib ablation? So if he had his second episode, there's no structural heart disease, what are we going to do? Excellent, excellent. We're going to start, his, we're going to start a little bit of metoprolol and give him his daily dose of aspirin. And why do we need to do this? Why didn't we pick an antiarrhythmic medication? The reason for that is because most of the symptoms of atrial fibrillation is due to the heart rate. And once you control the heart rate, their symptoms will significantly get better. And only when controlling heart rates and patient continues to have symptoms, this is when you should consider an antiarrhythmic medication, okay? Okay, so, so what's a, a normal heart rate, and what's the heart rate that I should say, okay, the heart rate is controlled during atrial fibrillation versus the heart rate is too fast during atrial fibrillation? Um, a resting, you want to have a resting heart rate less than 80 to 100 beats per minute. With moderate activity, you want a heart rate less than 120 beats per minute. Okay, that's why my patients who have atrial fibrillation, fast walk in the hole, back and forth, do it a couple times. You want to get a heart rate of 120. You want to get an average heart rate of around less than 90 beats per minute. But very importantly, you want to make sure that they can get up to 85% of their maximum predicted heart rate. Because often what happens with these guys, they come to see us and we start loading them with beta blocker and calcium channel blockers and we get their heart rate 50 beats per minute and the poor guy cannot get his heart rate above 110 beats per minute. So all we did replaced a fast heart rate with a slow heart rate. Oh, but we're very happy because we can get a pacemaker in this guy. <laughs> no. So find some place in the middle where you can get his heart rate under control, yet this patient is able to get maximum predicted heart rate. So it's okay to ask your patient to walk fast. Sometimes we send our patients for a, for a stress test to make sure that they get a heart rate. And if you cannot, then you could consider, for example, treating this problem with antiarrhythmic medication. So every time I see a patient with atrial fibrillation, I ask myself these three questions. Is the heart rate controlled? Okay. And if the heart rate controlled, fine, yes or no. And then the second question I ask is, do I need a rhythm control management? And I said, antiarrhythmic medications, you only consider them if the first, if heart rate management failed. And the third question that you need to ask yourself, do I need to give them Coumadin? So what are the key scenarios that where we would give Coumadin versus no Coumadin? It all depends on something called the CHAD score. CHADS is C, congestive heart failure, hypertension, age above 75, diabetes mellitus, and stroke. So heart failure would get a score of 1, hypertension would get a score of 1, age above 75, score of 1, diabetes mellitus gets a score of 1, and a stroke or a TIA gets a score of 2. If, and then you add this the score. If you get 2 or above, then the patient needs to be on Coumadin. If you get zero, then a little bit of aspirin. If you got one, then you can either be aspirin or cumulin. Patients who have mitral stenosis or valve, or, uh, we have a, a mechanical valve, they need to be on cumulin, okay? However, there are some other scenarios that you need to know about. If a patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is when their heart is very, very thick. It's a genetic disorder where the heart is very thick. These folks, irrespective of their CHAD score, they need to be on Coumadin. 
And if they have hyperthyroidism, this is, you guys are gonna see this way more often than me. Patient comes with a hyperthyroidism, they are in atrial fibrillation, their CHAT score is zero. Give them Coumadin. They are hypercoagulable until you get them euthyroid, okay? Once they become euthyroid, stop the Coumadin. Special group that don't need Coumadin are mitral regurgitation. And this is a favorite question on the board. Somebody to tell you has mitral regurgitation, you think that they have valvular problem, throw the Coumadin. It's only mitral stenosis that needs Coumadin. The other case scenario that I want to talk about atrial fibrillation is pregnancy. With pregnancy, always look for a cause because it could be that the patient has rheumatic heart disease and you stress the heart a little bit by a little bit of fluid overload from the pregnancy and then the patient had atrial fibrillation. So you get an echo, make sure that they're not hyperthyroid also. Heart rate control with pregnancy is a little bit tricky, and one of the safest medicines we have is the Joxin. The problem with the Joxin is that it doesn't work when the patient is active. It only works for nursing home patients. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It only works when the patient is not doing anything. Okay, so if the patient is sitting, laying flat in the hospital, and this is where we, we, get, we get in trouble because the patient comes from outside, we start giving them a lot of digoxin, we get their heart rate to 80 and 70 beats per minute, they're ready to get out of, the bed, out of bed, and they walk from here to there, and suddenly their heart rate goes up to 120, 130. It does not work, it does not control the rate if you have sympathetic, um, if the sympathetic system is working. Beta blocker is a good medicine for pregnancy, but you have to take the risk of a little bit low birth weight. However, it's not a big problem. Cardizam and verapamil, you have to worry about them, and um, you have to stop them, actually. I think last, I would stop them at the last month of pregnancy because you don't want a very long labor. Anticoagulation, use the same scores, CHAT2 score. However, in the first and third trimester, use heparin. Second trimester, you can use Coumadin. Um, it's safe to do DC cardioversions in pregnant women. So if they're pregnant and AFib and they're decompensated, go ahead and go ahead and do uh, the cardioversion. Antiarrhythmic medications that we've been given in pregnant women are usually procainamide and quinidine. The rest is not a wise decision. For elderly patients who have atrial fibrillation and you want to give them anticoagulation, uh, give them warfarin, we're always trying to balance risk of bleeding versus the need for anticoagulations. Elderly patients are at actually a significantly increased risk of um, um, stroke compared to other patients, so uh, try to balance these two together. Don't use a statement in your note, oh, the patient is too old and I'm worried about them falling and that's why I stopped Coumadin because that's not going to hold in court, okay? If you want to make sure that they're, they're send them for occupational therapy, send them for physical therapy, let them do good physical therapy and occupational therapy to strengthen their muscle, you might, if, you might impact this balance problem. As let them make, tell, make that decision for you that actually they're not steady or they're steady. So, but don't use that, uh, use that statement, they're too old for anticoagulations, okay? Because the risk of actually a stroke is much higher and their benefit from anticoagulation is way more than other population group. Okay, um, the other thing I wanna talk about is pre-procedural management of anticoagulation. If you get this a lot, patient is, has atrial fibrillation, they're on Coumadin, they're going for their hernia or surgery. Can I stop the Coumadin? Do I need to bridge? Only bridge if they are at a significantly, significantly high risk of stroke. And these folks are patients who have CVA, prior left atrial appendageal clot, mechanical valve, or mitral stenosis. Otherwise, it's safe to stop the Coumadin for a week with no need for uh, Lovenox or any of that, okay? You have to remember. So let's ask ourselves some questions about atrial fibrillation. 56-year-old gentleman with severe mitral regurgitation, left ventricular function is normal, no diabetes, mellitus, or hypertension, no prior history of stroke. Are you gonna give them aspirin, Coumadin, or aspirin or Coumadin? Excellent, we're gonna vote, I'm not gonna say, aspirin. I completely agree. The patient's chat score is zero. We said that mitral regurgitation actually 
is not a risk for stroke, and some actually, some report it's actually may, may be, not necessarily, may be protective for stroke, but we're not sure. May protect from stroke, but it's not a... A 68-year-old lady with history of atrial fibrillation for the past six years, negative past medical history, admitted with a black toe that resolved after a day or two. No diabetes mellitus, hypertension, or stroke, EKG, atrial fibrillation, normal left ventricular function with an echocardiogram. Are you going to give aspirin, coumadin, or aspirin or coumadin? Again, let's apply the CHADS2 score. Oh, no. Okay. This patient came with a black toe. The same blood clot that can go up to the brain, it can go anywhere. It can go to the belly, it can go to the kidneys, it can go to the heart, it can go to the finger, it can go to the toe. So patients who have systemic embolization, give them Coumadin. This was a trick question, because in Chad's, in Chad's score, there's no systemic embolization. If somebody has history of systemic embolization, use, give them Coumadin. This could be a black toe, this could be somebody who came to the hospital with GI bleed. Your gastroenterologist scoped him, and there's evidence of bowel ischemia. The patient has AFib, Coumadin. Patient comes in with kidney infarction, Coumadin. So this blood clot goes 20% of the time to the brain, but 80% of the time could go anywhere else, okay? So systemic embolization is, if a family has some systemic embolization, they need to be on Coumadin. Okay, excellent. So this, we're gonna go back to that same gentleman the, that you saw and you thought that he has atrial fibrillation. He was admitted to the hospital with palpitation that started eight hours ago, and he's, he's still on taking his beta blocker and aspirin. And what are you gonna do next now? He's in atrial fibrillation and telling you, doc, I don't feel very well. Do you wanna, what do you wanna do with me? Are you gonna start him on heparin and do a cardioversion and then give him warfarin for four weeks? Are you gonna give him warfarin and then bring him back in three weeks and do a cardioversion? Are you gonna give, proceed with chemical cardioversion with ibutylide or do a cardioversion and then send him home? Or are you gonna do a TEE then cardiovert him? Or are you gonna give him your favorite drug, Amiodaron, for six hours and reassess? This guy is a young guy, he knows when he goes into atrial fibrillation, he told me, man, eight hours ago I was perfectly fine and now I feel I started having these palpitations. So, so what are we gonna do next? Let's vote. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about cardioverting somebody who has atrial fibrillation. The, the, the numbers that you have to remember is 48. Okay, it's 48 hours. If the atrial fibrillation has been going on for less than 48 hours, you can safely cardiovert this guy, okay? There's no worry about forming any blood clots or anything like that. So if somebody has 48 hours, if they're, if they're less than 48 hours, go ahead and cardiovert them. His chat store is less than a zero, so he doesn't need to be uncommitted. So cardiovert him and send him home. Let somebody drive him home. If you don't know for how long the patient has been atrial fibrillation or the duration of atrial fibrillation is more than 48 hours, then you're left with two things. Either do a TE cardioversion or give them Coumadin for three weeks and then cardiovert them. Okay? Um, can I have two slides, Minin? Yeah, sure. Okay. I'm, or do you want me? Okay, just because this is important for them. I'm going to have a couple more questions. Uh, grandma is a 78-year-old lady with history of atrial fibrillation for the past 15 years. She has had DDD pacemaker implanted for, six, for um, bradycardia eight years ago for slow heart rates. She has diabetes mellitus. She's been taking warfarin and metoprolol. Her blood pressure is 120 over 60. You checked, they checked their device and they told you everything is okay. She pretty much does everything she wants and her echo is perfectly fine. What are you gonna do next with this lady? Are you gonna cardiovert her and give her an antiarrhythmic medication? Are you gonna cardiovert her and give her amiodarone? Are you gonna start amiodarone and then cardiovert her? Or are you gonna leave her alone? Excellent, we're gonna leave this lady alone because again, the only reason we cardiovert somebody is for symptoms, okay? The only reason we give uh, patients with anti uh, antiarrhythmic medications is symptoms. 
If the heart rate is controlled and there are anticoagulation, just leave these people alone. And this is based on the AFFIRM trial. The AFFIRM trial is a trial where we wanted to know whether actually if you control people, put them back in normal rhythm, whether you're going to make them live longer. And what we found actually it's the opposite. If anything, it's the opposite. And the reason for that is antiarrhythmic medications cause problems. They could cause bradycardia, they could cause ventricular tachycardias. So you have to justify the reason why would you give somebody an amiodarone or any other antiarrhythmic medications. Um, one last word about atrial flutter, because this patient has atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is similar to atrial fibrillation. It used the same heart rate anticoagulation protocol, the same thing that you would apply for atrial fibrillation. The only difference is that if you ablated a patient, if somebody ablated a patient with atrial flutter, they don't need to be on, on Coumadin for a very long time, okay? You can stop the Coumadin after they get their ablation, one month after the ablation. I have a 76-year-old gentleman with history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, presents with acute sudden onset of severe chest pain and shortness of breath at rest for two hours duration. General, I, you looked at this guy and he's like breathing heavily. Heart rate is rapid. He has a little bit of JVDs. Lungs crackles on the bases. Extremity, there's no edema, but they're cold and sweaty. Blood pressure is 80 over 55. Heart rate is 150. EKG, atrial fibrillation with heart rate of 150 beats per minute. What are you going to do with this guy? Are you going to give him cardism, low pressure, IV nitroglycerin, followed by dopamine if the blood pressure decreased? Or are you going to do cardioversion? Or are you going to start MU? So history of ischemic cardiomyopathy. He's huffing and puffing, tachycardic. He has crackles on the examination. His lower extremities are cold and sweaty. What are you going to do next? Excellent. Excellent. So this guy is sick. OK. This guy has hemodynamically significant atrial fibrillation. This is not the atrial fibrillation that you see with a heart rate of 120 or with a patient with palpitation. This guy's cardiac output is very low. He has pulmonary edema, and there's nothing actually perfusing. Why? Because you looked at his feet, they're cold, and there's no blood going in there. Sweaty. Sympathetic system is very, very active. You don't give them nitroglycerin because it's going to lower their heart rate. You don't give that combination of dopamine and cardizam that I see that sometimes in the emergency department, one to lower the heart rate and one to increase the blood pressure. Dopamine will always increase the blood heart rate. So the best treatment is for cardioversion. So if you see somebody with symptomatic hypertension, heart failure, chest pain, unstable angina, don't waste your time. Shock that guy, okay? Very simple. I'm going to take you to the other, the other extreme here. You have an 82-year-old gentleman with history of atrial fibrillation, diabetes mellitus, heart failure, and chronic renal insufficiency. Admitted with diarrhea, blurred vision, halos. Around, halos. He's been on Kimidin, digoxin, insulin, metoprolol, and his heart rate is 100 over 50. BUN creatinine 50 or 3.4, and this is his EKG. What are you going to do next? And what is this, by the way? Can, what would you think about? I'm sorry? PAT. And, but uh, what's the diagnosis after this PAT? Excellent. This is digoxin toxicity. Okay, this is PAT from digoxin toxicity. And how are we going to treat this? Are we going to stop the digoxin and dialyze? Are you going to stop the digoxin and digibond? And if it fails, there, are we going to decrease the digoxin? Or are we going to stop the digoxin and start dopamine drip and hopefully get his heart rate better? Excellent. Can we dialyze the digoxin? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. This is the problem. Otherwise, we would have done it. Um, so the treatment of choice is to give digibond. Excellent. Um, so when you think about HL tachycardia with advanced AV block, think about digoxin toxicity and think about Digibond. Uh, Mr. Jones is a 75-year-old gentleman with history of symptomatic 
paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who was admitted with atrial fibrillation and rapid ventricular rate. Medical regimen is warfarin and digoxin. Cardiology were consulted, and they wrote this small note, consider amiodarone, start amiodarone 200 milligram daily. Okay, what are you gonna do now? Are you gonna decrease the warfarin and decrease the digoxin? Are you gonna increase the warfarin and decrease the digoxin? You're not gonna change the warfarin and decrease the digoxin, or you're gonna decrease the warfarin and no need to change the digoxin. You're gonna see a lot of this on your board. They love these questions. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna add amiodarone to somebody who's taken six of warfarin and 0.25 of digoxin. So let's vote. Unfortunately, I have to decrease both, okay? With amio, you have to decrease both, okay? Um, you can argue, you definitely decrease warfarin. You can argue about the digoxin because, but I would decrease, I would decrease both uh, because it's, um, it increases the dish level in the body. The drugs that you, I want you to know that may increase INRs or increase the bleeding risk are usually Tylenol, but it's not about that big of a deal. Alcohol, amiodarone, and anabolic steroids, you're not gonna see a lot of patients who have atrial fibrillation on anabolic steroids, but may. Antibiotic, except penicillin and rifampin. Thyroid hormone, the things that may decrease INR is usually the carbamazepine. This is our favorite drug. Started somebody on barbiturate or carbamazepine. You have to decrease, um, you have to increase the chemidin, oral contraceptive pills, penicillin, rifampin may do the same thing. And St. John Wort and multivitamins have vitamin K. So <clears throat> if you wanna give digoxin and verapamil, you wanna add verapamil to a patient who's taken digoxin, decrease the digoxin. If you wanna give amiodarone to somebody who's taken digoxin, decrease the digoxin. Um, this is my last slide. Um, rate control, remember this. In patients with atrial fibrillation, start with rate control because rate control may take care of the symptoms and improve the function of the heart. Think about antiarrhythmic medications or referral to a cardiologist or uh, somebody like me. If the rate control management failed to control the patient's symptoms or if they have heart failure, and please, please know the anticoagulation guidelines, especially what I mean, the chat score. Thank you very much for listening.